Life Takes Guts with Nidhi Swaroop. Hear from a mother caring for a child with ulcerative colitis in Singapore. Ko B. Man, mother of a daughter with IBD. Her eldest daughter started with severe eczema at 2 years of age and then at 4 years of age. Hi, hi. Hi, Biman. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Nidhi. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Uh, a very warm welcome to you at our podcast. It's titled Life Takes Guts with Nidhi Swaroop. So a very warm welcome to you. To our yeah, show. <laughs> so today we will uh, talk about your daughter um, who was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. But as a parent, maybe you can share with us how did the journey start with any kind of medical condition? Um, just share with us how the whole thing started. Yeah. All right. Uh, my daughter was born uh, in year 2009. At, at about two years old, she started having very severe eczema. Mm. And then right about 2013, that was about four plus years old. From the eczema situation, we constantly applied. She was con- constantly taking topical steroids and all that. That was really one difficult medical condition to deal with. And then mm. in 2013, she started having this strange um, fever and runny nose that didn't go away. And so we took her to the GP a lot. And then my husband noticed that her stomach was bloated. Mm. So the GP decided to take a look and press the tummy and then he noticed that there was a lump or swelling at the abdominal area mm. and so he said that oh this is not normal we must send her straight away to the a and e mm. to get it investigated mm. yeah because it could be a tumor it could be anything right so the doctor ran a lot of tests on her so they ruled out cancer leukemia and all that and then they did the autoimmune panel. Then they found out that it was uh, inflammation of the liver. Uh, so the liver has uh, grown bigger because it was inflamed. Uh, and so this normal is when she people, is, she is about four, four plus. Years yeah, at four. Mm. Yeah. So that one, the treatment was through oral steroids to bring down the inflammation of the liver because mm-hmm. uh, this illness, um, if it's not uh, managed, the liver will be scarred. So mm-hmm. scarred liver means you have you know bad liver function and liver takes care of all the major processes in the body. So mm-hmm. uh, it'll be very bad. Lah. And then mm-hmm. you need liver transplant. Oh uh, mm-hmm. So the doctor got to bring down the inflammation by giving her oral steroids and tried uh, immunosuppressants. So the treatment is quite similar to IBD. La. Mm. Uh, so the diagnosis is autoimmune disease. Hepatitis. Hepatitis. Yeah. So it's called hepatitis of... Autoimmune. Uh, autoimmune hepatitis. Uh. Because when, when we hear as lay people, we only know hepatitis A, B... You know, uh, in that uh, way, uh, those but... are caused by virus, lah. So oh. this one is the the body's immune system not okay. functioning properly and is attacking its own liver cells. Oh, uh, quite okay. similar to IBD, lah. It's still attacking the liver cell. IBD is attacking the gut, lah. Okay, yeah, the uh, digestive tract gets affected. Yes, so in this yes, case, yes. it's the liver that got affected and yes. it leads to inflammation. Yeah. Yes. So other than bloating, was there any other symptom that uh, she was experiencing? Mm, some people will experience uh, jaundice, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. yellowing of the eyes and the skin. skin uh, yes. But she didn't have these symptoms. La. So thank goodness. La, because when you have yellowing eyes and darker urine, that means very serious already. Even okay. worse. So this was like an early diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. You, you... So thankfully, la, she, she had runny nose and all that fever at the same time. So we discovered it incidentally. Mm. Yeah, because we were checking her for eye oil, the cough and runny nose and all that doesn't go away. Then it just so happened that we discovered we had this other big problem, bigger problem. So mm. thank God it was all the right timing. La. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so 
there is there is medication to manage the yes long term medication as well okay so these are steroids or what kind of uh, or, oral steroids and then uh, immunosuppressants la like is the okay. bioprene or that okay yeah, yeah yeah so that was started when she's 4 years old four plus yeah. and there were changes in her diet at that time had to be yeah. made so or? back then so i would make it more healthy la home cooked food gluten free okay. diet okay. yeah then we took her so to traditional were... chinese medicine or so oh you tried that also we tried okay. but It doesn't. It doesn't help. Yeah, it okay. doesn't really help, lah. Okay, okay. So the there was guidance from the dietitian <clears throat> in the in the hospital regarding this uh, management. Yes, yes. They would give some special formula. Uh, how to say ah uh, to boost her growth, and then the mm-hmm. protein is easier to digest because the mm-hmm. liver is not functioning so well, ah. Uh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. So that one took quite a while to recover for the liver to shrink back to normal size ah uh, and then the liver enzymes to come down to almost normal. It was still mildly elevated even today but the doctor just check for trend lah uh, as long as it's not trending worse and it's pretty close to normal. Okay. To so it took about how many months you would say to kind of manage the inflammation of the liver. At least one to two years I think. One to two years of tweaking yeah. of tweaking of medication. So, I would imagine she was still in <laughs> kindergarten, uh, four to six years of age. Yeah, so she, she stopped still, schooling, lah. She stopped. Yeah, because she was catching infections so easily from the steroids. Oh, immunosuppressants and, and steroids would lead ah. to yeah because it would suppress the immune system and then the body becomes more susceptible to infections. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So okay, so you you had her at home and you were caring for oh wow yes no kindergarten no childcare no nothing no. like that how about your social life at that time social so, life ah uh, we kept it normal as as normal as possible okay. uh, we didn't isolate ourselves or what otherwise yes. it would be very traumatizing very difficult so we need to yeah. keep life as normal as possible like we yeah. go to church regularly and we keep going we visit our In laws, they she plays with Family. her cousin and grandparents. Yes. So okay. Keep that up regularly. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. So <laughs> this went on for about two years, and after two years, it's under kind of under control. Yes, yes. Then she yeah. was ready then for primary she, one. Primary la. school. Yes, yeah. yes. I would imagine. So then it was all as per normal, uh, starting primary school. Or yeah, was there, I think. I mean, I'm just imagining. Do the school teachers have to be briefed so that the child has this condition? Yes, yes. So, uh, when you go to school normally, they will ask you to fill up a medical form. So you just inform them lah that the child has this condition. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and then what she's not to eat, especially during field trips. Sometimes teachers may provide food. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but okay. So that is primary school starts, and then she's able to function. Even when it comes to sports and other activities, because there will be some co-curricular activities in the school, so yeah, she, she was functioning do... normally. All the okay. daily activities was okay, as per normal. Fantastic! Yes, that's yes, so nice yes. to hear. Yeah. So then, what happened after maybe another two years or so? Yeah. Um, Now, when the... I she had this liver problem, I as I was doing all the research on this autoimmune condition. They did put down, uh, how to say, information to say that uh, it puts you more at at risk. You are at risk for other types of autoimmune disease. Once you mm-hmm. get one, mm-hmm. you may get it in the eye, or you may get a uh, joint inflammation, or you may get it in the gut. So I was like, mm, okay, I hope this is not the case for yeah. me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, but by the time she was a primary three, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, primary three, mm-hmm. starting a primary three, mm-hmm. she began to have. Other symptoms like going uh-huh. to the bathroom more frequently. Oh, urgency! So that, yeah, that's like diarrhea, is it? Diarrhea, diarrhea. Oh. Mm. So her IBD symptoms is more to a uh, diarrhea. No, oh, so you mean yeah, no uh, blood? But was she diagnosed at that time that she has inflammatory bowel disease? No. Oh, so okay. at primary three, I did highlight to the doctor, mm. but he's. They thought that it's just a normal diarrhea, lah. Mm, Because like I think at the early stages, yeah, okay. they did not suspect it was IBD, lah. Mm. So I think early stages IBD, the diarrhea symptom is quite similar to any normal other, any, any other, other infection that people yes. have. Sometimes people have IBS. 
and yeah. there's diarrhea and it just settles when things are kind of normal. Yeah. So, so that is what was suspected initially. So mm. how, what, what happened later? Where, was there like a referral to an IBD specialist? Was there something that changed? Um, how did she get the diagnosis? Okay, um, at the hospital that we go to, the specialist that takes care of the liver illness is the same specialist that takes care of IBD cases as well. Oh, okay, okay. Right. So, did they do a colonoscopy after the uh, diarrhea? Right. So, at first, the specialist did not suspect IBD, but mm -hmm. he became, he was suspicious when I told him that uh, my daughter woke up in the night to go empty oh. her bowel. Uh, oh, okay. Right. And that so after would many be... months of on and off diarrhea, they recovered and then come back, recover mm. and then diarrhea again. Mm. Then the final straw was when she started waking up in the night. Oh. Uh, so that's when the specialist ordered a scope for her. Mm. Uh, so she's from still in primary three at that time. Primary three. So mm -hmm. end of primary three, then it was formally diagnosed. La. Yeah, so it's around nine or ten years old by then. She is Primary three, yes, yes. Yeah, about nine or ten <coughs> years old. Okay. So then when she's diagnosed, I'm just wondering what was going through... Was, was she able to understand her diagnosis? Was uh, I think she can. She knows that she's sick. Uh. Oh, okay. And and what's your response when the doctor tells you there is this autoimmune condition called inflammatory bowel disease that your daughter has? A bit of a mixed feeling uh, because I, you know, moms do a lot of Google research and you kind of already suspect something is not right, but the doctor mm. tell you, okay, it's okay, it's okay. And then now that I have this formal diagnosis, it, it was a little relief because I confirmed my suspicions. Mm -hmm. And now we can move forward and find a treatment. Mm -hmm. But then it was also quite discouraging that oh, I, could now another, I got another autoimmune condition to deal with. Yeah, because if I hear correctly, she first <laughs> had the skin problem, like eczema kind of uh, thing when she's a baby. And then she has the autoimmune hepatitis. And then comes the third one. And she's only nine years old, nine or 10 years old. Yeah. So it, it is a big thing for a parent. I'm, I'm a mother of three children also. And I'm like, my heart goes out to you as a parent. How do you deal with this? And of course, your husband also. Um, how, how was he responding to the new diagnosis? If you could share mm -hmm. that a little bit. He's always very calm. I think it's important to have the other parent being calm and steady. He's like my rock, you know? Wow. So while I'm very emotional yes. and... <laughs> yeah. 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 So he would, you know, hang on and hold the family together. La. Wow. I, I think and he by this... a very important role. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, having a, a spouse and especially when it is a father and a child, especially a girl child. I think there's a special bond, you know. Fathers have this special thing for uh, a soft corner for daughters. And then you. this is your first child. Mm. So naturally, the, the there will be something. Yeah, but he took it very calmly and was a steady, I think, uh, a steady rock, I would say. Mm, mm. Yes. So that's yep. amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And, okay. And... At this time, now that there's another diagnosis, was there again a change in her diet that you had to make any change? Yes, I did some more research and all that. I came across this diet called the varied diets so that people have tried. Some people just swear by it that it worked for mm -hmm. them. So, okay, so I went on ahead to try it, mm -hmm. like no carb diet or okay, yeah, and all that. Yeah, uh, but did it, it didn't help? work for her. But then, okay, so you tried for how long? Was it so? I the diets that I've tried, I've tried this uh specific carbohydrate diet. That yes. one didn't really work out for her. Mm -hmm. Then I tried some strange oatmeal diet that oh. also didn't really work out for her. <laughs> then until I'm um uh, got to know a a friend who's a dietitian. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to know her through another mutual friend, mm -hmm. and then she introduced me to the Ford Map diet. Okay. So it was a diet that was very helpful for patients with IBD oh. um, taken together with their medications and all that, it will help to uh, reduce symptoms. La. Mm. 
Mm. So she walked me through the process. So that was excellent, and I think that really helped her. Helped her. Okay. Yeah. So FODMAP is is that like an abbreviation of something? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit for the benefit of our listeners? Okay. Yeah. So FODMAP F O D M A P. I think okay. it's a diet to um how to say ah uh, reduces the ah. Uh, How do I put it in layman terms? Uh, there are certain food that the gut cannot consume because it contains okay. all these uh, complex sugars and is uh, generating a lot of gas and symptoms okay. and speed up the motility of the gut. So the mm. when you rule out all these type of food, your gut is able to digest better. Okay, something so like maybe, that. Yeah. So maybe if you can share certain examples, you know, let's say you you had to avoid or or eliminate certain. Food types, you know. Okay. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a few okay. things. Yeah, onion and garlic. So uh-huh. instead of we don't flavor our food with onion and garlic anymore. Okay. Mm. Uh, oatmeal was out of it. No nuts. The almond, almond. You cannot eat too much of it. Okay. And uh, and then we kept to a low fi- fiber diet also, so it's easier mm-hmm. on the gut because the gut okay. is injured already. You see. Mm-hmm. So we want to reduce the. Stress on the gut, lah. Okay. okay. Uh, watermelon juice also uh, tends to make you make the gut move faster. So okay. we want to reduce the number of trips to the bathroom. So and so ease her digestion. Taking, so stop yeah. taking watermelon also. That was yes, yes. That was the thing, and and it was working for her by yeah, by yeah, yeah. All these, yeah. Okay, that's like that's onions very... and garlic tend to make you very gassy. Oh. Uh, and, so, and they they are like so important when it comes to Asian food. Yes, uh, in Asian diet, we use a lot of onions, garlic, ginger. But I suppose ginger, you could ginger have is continued. all right. Yeah, you could have continued, right? So wow, it's it's quite a lot of things for you to think through and then yes. prepare. Yeah, for the so family. for parents who are interested in this, they can look up the Monash University Fort Map app. So there's okay. a app for it wow. that guides you through it. Okay. Wow. What that's amount of very, food to eat? Yeah, yeah, that's a very useful tip. Yeah, thanks for sharing yes. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is like she's in primary three at that time. Yes. So primary and, four would be the recovery period, lah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so she's she's. And tell me a little bit about you know is she now beginning to grow and you know the height and weight these are things that are a big concern when uh, children get IBD yeah so okay. what's happening in her case okay her growth was already stunted due to the autoimmune hepatitis at the beginning because mm-hmm. she was on a lot of steroids she was mm-hmm. one head shorter than all her peers. Mm. So when then she had this second diagnosis, mm. it did it doesn't help the situation. Also, she her growth was also stunted again. Ah, mm. yeah, she was one head shorter than all her peers. Oh. Yeah. Was there anything like a supplement or you know there was was there something that the doctors recommended would help her? Is there anything like that? Um, the doctors are. Uh, Mentioned that a uh, control of the disease is the key to helping her grow. Uh. Mm. So basically, yeah. once you control the to, inflammation, yeah. manage yeah. the disease well, uh. Okay. Okay. So compliance yes. to the dosage, the medication that is prescribed by the doctors. Make sure she takes all on time and the number of, let's say, tablets. Mm-hmm. If it's like four mm-hmm. tablets, make sure you take four tablets. If it has to be taken twice a day, take twice a day, kind of thing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Once the disease is well managed, the mm. growth will come back naturally, lah. Okay. So parents don't need to stress, like yo, how you can't force the growth on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it will naturally happen once you take care of all the recommendations. Yeah. Yes, yes, and, and then, then go for go for regular mm. monitoring, go for the blood tests and whatever scans that are recommended. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how often do, does she have to go for, let's say, a colonoscopy? Uh, she's been two times already. Primary three, one time, mm-hmm. and then last year, sec one, she went one time. So that's like uh, thirteen years old four, and prime four years. Uh, four years, yeah, yeah. So there was no need to do any other kind of a scan, like CT scan or X ray or MRI or anything like that. No, no not necessary. No need. Yeah, not, oh, necessary. not necessary. Okay, okay. Regular yes. blood tests and stool tests, I think. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, is it like um, every 
three months or four months? Was what, what was the frequency of the blood test? Uh, I think now stable already. The the blood test is maybe five to six months. Okay. Yeah. Okay. When it's and not this... so stable, it will be one to two months, lah. Okay. Okay. So in the oh. beginning, I would imagine she needed more often the blood uh. tests to monitor. Yes. And that would also help in the doctor adjusting the dosage. For yes, yes, and see whether she's responding or not, lah, to the medication. Yes, yes. Okay. So currently, she's on uh, any kind of biologics or immunosuppressants or steroids, because we we all know about the pyramid, ah. yeah, the the medication pyramid. There's the remission drugs, then there's the steroids, and it could be immunosuppressants or biologics. So, which kind of class class of medication is she on? Ah, uh, she's on the oral mesalazine. Uh. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's oral. all. That's, that's all. all she needs. Wow, that's uh, amazing. Let me see. She also has an autoimmune hepatitis drug. Yes. So yes. that she's on the low dose prednisolone. Okay. The low dose one. That's a steroid. Five milligram. It? Yeah. That's a steroid. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because so her, her is... condition is a bit complicated. Got to manage the liver condition as of well course. as the IBD. So it will be the of medication course. will be um her oral prednisolone, the low dose one, and then the erso diol. Yeah. Mes- and then the or- oral mesolazine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so all, all quite of... simple like, All can yeah. be taken orally. No jabs. No nothing like. Nothing. Yeah. Okay. That's <clears> that's very reassuring. And uh, share with us that her diagnosis was ulcerative colitis. Mm. Yeah. So in her case, alongside with diarrhea, was there blood? Oh, she don't have blood. Hers is just no. a lot of di- diarrhea and urgency, waking up in the night. Okay. Yeah. Because there are, that means, um, uh, what I hear from doctors is it could be a mild case, moderate or severe. Yeah. So in the mild case, we hear of a lot of diarrhea, whereas in the moderate case, it could be a little bit of blood, whereas moderate to severe can be a lot of blood along with diarrhea. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is more like a mild case. So was it shared by the doctor that this is a case of ulcerative colitis, but it's mild? Mm, the doctor didn't say it was mild. He, mm-hmm. they, he put it as more towards tick towards the moderate, moderate. Like, because the frequency of the diarrhea ah. was like 8 to 10 times a day wow. and waking up in the night. Wow. Yeah, so yeah. that is definitely beyond mild. Beyond mild. Okay. But so you're not, not quite just, severe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, not just the, the you know, like as, as a layperson, when we are looking at how many trips we are going to the toilet or if we are looking at what else is coming out, you know, some people have a lot of mucus, some have blood, So it varies from person to person. Yes, yes. Yeah. So when you're saying that, okay, if the number of diarrhea is also a lot, Uh it can be then classified as moderate. Yeah. Or it could be number of diarrhea is a little bit lesser, but there's blood. Then that can also be moderate, Mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the urgency also. Yeah, the urgency. You can't hold back. Sometimes there are accidents. Um, how was she in managing all this in the school? You know? uh, in school, it was very stressful. The accident happened before, but oh. thankfully, her, she had a friend who was very supportive and called mm. me. Mm. Yeah. Mm. She had friends who were very supportive. Okay. So and teachers were to... also very kind to her. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. They, they allow her to go to the bathroom now. Mm. As and when she needs to go, they won't question you. Yeah, yeah. Because they are aware she has the yes. medical yes. condition. So it's important for the <sighs> teachers, the school system to be aware of the child living with the condition. Mm. Is there is no benefit in hiding and, and it's better to talk about it. And if the friends also know that what is what is it that she's going through. They can support her in the way your daughter was helped, isn't it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, what was there a need for her to wear a diaper to to manage herself in in the uh, school or at night maybe? Yeah. No, I don't think the diaper helped because the urgency and the amount was quite a lot. So it leaks out. It makes a big mess anyway. Oh. Doesn't really help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then because by then I'm guessing that she's old enough to be able to respond. You know, when the urgency yeah, is yeah, even at yeah. night, she's able to get up and go 
to the toilet because right yeah but accidents still happen uh, sometimes cannot make it yeah. in time oh yeah was it in in the school i hear from some other patients that uh, sometimes the teacher would say the student who is living with let's say ulcerative colitis or with crohn's disease can sit closer to the door oh uh, yes yes easier to go to the toilet yeah Yes, uh, and in- exam time also during the national exams like PSLE, uh, you can ask for special permission. Mm-hmm. That, the board and, exams. Yeah, yeah the then they exams. will extend your timing also oh, for your... Uh, that's very yeah. kind of... The, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So they won't penalize you because you've gone to the bathroom and they know that you have this condition. La. Okay, okay. So that's uh, very, very supportive for her. How about when it comes to sports and games and other activities? Was she... Uh, able to manage or was she going through a lot of fatigue? She was definitely very tired with sports and even going to school was very tiring. She mm-hmm. can't make it to school on time mm-hmm. because in the whole night she, she doesn't sleep through the night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but as and whenever she's well enough to do things like cycling, going for walks, going rock climbing, would we'll take her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So by then, um, <clears throat> does she have siblings? I'm like, I think she's by the first that, child. Yes. By that age, she would have three younger siblings already. Okay. Yes. And, and they are aware of her condition. They are aware that uh, the older sister is not well, but they don't know the details. Yeah, they're too young, right? Yeah. They, they, they would be very young to understand the whole extent. But as a parent, what kind of challenge do you face when you're feeding? You have four children at the dining table. Do you prepare separate food for her or everyone's taking this kind of a diet? Uh, we have to prepare separate food for her because um, when the symptoms is very severe, her food will be definitely much more bland. Mm. Right? I cannot expect the others to eat the same food. Yes. Right? And so she would feel quite left out. Oh. But she's quite strong. She she bears with it. Yeah. I think so. that's something that the illness brought out in her. La. Patience wow. and perseverance. Oh, fantastic. So nice to hear that. And I hear from other parents too that Children seem to be more resilient than adults. Yeah, they they realize that this is happening, and then okay, let's move on. Let's do what's the right thing to do, and that's it. You know, they, they are able yeah. to cope better. Yeah. Whereas as parents, I mean, I am a mother, and I also have Crohn's disease. I I just feel that managing my own self is relatively easier. As opposed to if one of my child, you know, one of my children had the condition, I think I'd be a little more stressed out. Yeah. Uh, my heart really goes out to you and your husband mm. dealing with uh, one child that has IBD and the others are doing fine. I mean, if it comes to parenting, there would definitely be a, a greater need for you to spend time with yeah, uh, the firstborn, yeah? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, so how do you deal with this? That there are other children and you cannot ignore them, is it? Mm-hmm. How, how do you uh, I think that's where the grandparents and uncles and aunties came in to help. Uh, extended mm, family extended and church family. members. Yeah, they played with the other kids a lot and yeah. make sure that they are attended to. Uh. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Especially and during this... medical appointments, sometimes can take many, many hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then there's nobody at home. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. This is where the the point that we sometimes discuss is when there's a chronic illness, a patient in the family is not living alone. The patient and and in fact the entire family gets affected. The you know the caregivers, the fam, the be it the parents, the siblings, the person who's the primary caregiver is going through a lot. Not just the patient that is going through. So this brings in that key point that you have brought out that extended family members also can pitch in mm-hmm. and help mm-hmm. out. You know? mm-hmm. And it is so significant because if, if I'm imagining you're living in another country where distances are so huge, it becomes mm-hmm. a bigger burden, bigger, bigger challenge for mm-hmm. the family mm-hmm. to cope. Yeah. So hats off to the family. And I think a a note of gratitude for your extended family (laughs) to help you out in this case. As the children are growing up, because once they are grown up and then they are on their own feet, 
you know, by the time she's 18, she will be transit, you know, she'll be transitioning to an adult clinic. Yes, yes. Managing by herself. Yeah. So at this moment, she is like, uh, how old is she now? 14 now. 14. Yeah. So another four years and then, you know, she'll, she'll be on her own. It's a different phase of life, right? Yes. Yeah. So, and an assurance to parents, her physical growth. Now she's 14 years old. She's already almost as tall as me already. Wow. Yeah. Just to give some hope to yes. other parents who are facing this. As long as your disease is managed, you feed her well, make sure that she um, sleeps well, eats well, the, mm. the, the growth will catch up. Mm-hmm. Awesome. <clears throat> And, and as she's growing up, is she able to speak about her illness with the other friends? Because now she's moved from primary school to secondary school. And in this school, there are a new set of friends. Is she comfortable talking about the illness? No, she doesn't talk to her friends about this at all. Oh. Mm, I think they don't understand her also. They don't understand the complexity of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but so far she has attended all the school activities with camps. She takes a medication. I mean, the friend just don't understand. So they cannot. Yeah. So she just takes her medicines. Other than that, her symptoms are pretty much under control. So yeah, she's yeah. Almost like any other kid. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. So they don't understand. They don't understand. Yeah. Wow. But um, the disease has helped her to appreciate even normal things in life like eating. You know, wow. teenagers are usually are very concerned about eating. I don't want to get fat, always dieting. And then she's like, why are you doing that? Eat, you can eat. <laughs> Yeah, but then she would also be promoting healthy eating, not fast food. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and her friends would uh, see what she's saying and why she's saying that. So, <laughs> But it's good to create awareness around this issue because different people are getting diagnosed at different ages, some as young children, whereas some as young adults or even seniors get diagnosed with the illness. So if she can use certain materials, I think that will be helpful because um, some a small, um, maybe a small note for her that <laughs> sharing about or educating about this illness is helpful because in case somebody in their family gets diagnosed, they will know what it's about. Like all of us, when we got diagnosed, we didn't know about this illness, never heard about Crohn's disease in our family, never heard about ulcerative colitis. If we compare it to, let's say, diabetes or arthritis, everyone mm-hmm. knows someone that has mm-hmm. Diabetes, mm-hmm. you know? Whereas the illnesses we are talking about, we are talking about inflammatory bowel disease. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the minute we say IBD, everyone is like, what is that? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I'm coming from, that... Even though we have gone into remission, it's good. It's fantastic. But just talk about it so that others are aware. It doesn't come as a surprise. It doesn't, I'm I'm not saying that it might happen to the friends, but who knows? There might be someone in their circle who might get diagnosed because more and more people across Asia are getting diagnosed with this illness. Yeah. In in Singapore alone, there are 3,000 patients. Oh, yeah. yeah, 10 to 15 percent are children. And <clears throat> when we say children, it's below 18 years of age that we are talking about. So the more awareness there is, the better acceptance of the diagnosis and then doing the right thing. Then she is an example that, hey, you know, although I got diagnosed with one, two, three different things, but I took all the medicines. And I managed mm. my diet, you know, mom did a fantastic job doing, you know, the, the mm, food mm, part mm. of it. And, you know, also the father being a rock in the family, yes. you know, stabilizing the emotions, managing the stress, everything, you know. So she has a very privileged position to share this journey, which brings hope to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so that is something for her to think and process. And if she's comfortable, then... She can be talking and it, it'll help a lot of other people. Yeah, just just a, <laughs> just a point to make. <laughs> but going forward, I think I, I would be curious to hear from you that what's your hope? What's your dream going forward? You know, 
for her. Uh, definitely that she'll continue to be stable mm -hmm. in her health physically. Mm -hmm. And then my prayers and hope for her that she will bless others la, with the, whatever blessings that she has been receiving. La. Wow. Yeah. So beautiful. So beautiful. It should be an encouragement to others, especially when they face very difficult trials in life, mm -hmm. to give them hope. La. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another thing that uh, comes to my mind before we wrap up is, is there any any lesson you have learned along the way that you could share with another parent who might be seeing a child who's unwell or might be having a little bit of symptoms, not sure? Uh, is there anything that you would like to, you know, convey to other parents? Mm, I would say say that uh, don't give up hope, uh, just maintain course and uh, be as encouraging as you can to the child and you can overcome this together. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a very beautiful message for other parents. And thank you so much, Bima, for sharing this journey of your child. And we hope all the very best, all her dreams come true, her aspirations and your family's aspirations for her. They are, yeah, they are there to bless her and take her through this, 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 I mean, it's not just this one illness that we are talking about. We are not just talking about ulcerative colitis. We are talking about two, three conditions that she was diagnosed with, but she's an amazing, resilient girl and we wish all the best to her. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you. We hope you found today's conversation useful and we look forward to you joining us in the next episode. For more information about joining the patient support group, please contact the Crohn's and Colitis Society of Singapore. You can reach us via email at admin at ibd.org.sg or WhatsApp at plus 65 Do visit our website www.ibd.org.sg to know more about our annual seminar, financial assistance schemes and how you could join us as a member, meet other patients as well as parents of children living with IBD. This educational and public awareness project is kindly supported by the National Youth Council, Singapore.